Hey, do you know that the New York Times, you know, a pretty reputable newspaper, and there was an article in there written by an eminent art critic. Well, you know, art critic. Okay, so he's supposed to know something about art, and uh, I guess he criticizes it or reviews it or something like that. And he was saying, um, why would you go and look at a replica of something instead of looking at the real thing? Like if you went to the Louvre and you wanted to look at the, uh, you know, some of the famous paintings that are there, Michelangelo's stuff, you, you'd like to look at the original rather than the replica. And he applied it to uh, the, the case in pre, a prehistoric case in, in France. And I objected to what he wrote. I, I was lucky enough to, uh, when I was a student in, in um, France, to visit some of the painted caves. I actually don't work on the painted caves. I'm interested in the transition between what, what are called Neanderthalers, people who were around in Europe before us, and Homo sapiens, which we call ourselves. And, uh, they, you know, the, there was an interface between these two people and they were not exact, Neanderthalers weren't exactly the same as us, obviously. Um, but anyway, because they were about, you know, a couple of hundred thousand years before us. Anyway, I was in this part of the thing and in this part of France and I went down to this spot where there were a bunch of speleologists, the people who investigate caves. And so uh, these people are sliding into the caves and of course now they've got all sorts of fancy little bits and pieces for getting around in the caves. I just got to check on what happens when I press this button in the computer. I want because I want the next slide, not the one before it, and all that sort of stuff, okay? So just see what happens. Oh, good. Um, I'm going to remember it's this one, right next to the zero. Anyway, um, this part of France, well, the part where I live is actually volcanic, and uh, it's got different sorts of rocks. But this part, like much of the rest of France, is limestone, big limestone cliffs and rivers winding their way through it, whatever it is. And uh, see where well, that red circle is up in the in the top part of the picture? Some people were exploring up in there and they found an entrance to a cave that hadn't been seen before. And so they were using their electric lights and all that sort of thing. That, you know, it looks like little miners with their crash hats on and their little electric light, all looking marvellous. But the interesting thing about it is when they went inside this cave, they were using all the modern technology, but the people who'd been in there before were using little stone lamps with a hollow in them and a moss wick and burning oil, fat from reindeers or whatever it was. So these little lamps, and we... In Australia, we call this kind of lamp a slush lamp, you know, that we use by miners and various people like that when they first came here. But you can imagine that a little wick like that burning is a bit like a candle. It doesn't give a great deal of light. So the people who went into there were using these little things. And in lots of the painted caves in France, we found those little lamps. And sometimes, these days, we can have a look inside scrape out bits and pieces and find exactly what kind of fat it was, which is really interesting if you want to write a, a guidebook to food 100,000 years ago. The most elaborate and the, and the most special one was this one, which was found in Lascaux, when they were excavating some things in Lascaux, which was another cave I'll talk about in a sec, but um, when they found it, this was fairly elaborate. Look, much neater than those other ones. This is the David Jones model as opposed to the Audi models which were in the picture before. No, nothing against Audi, of course, but anyway, this is a flash one. Still just a little glimmer of light. So uh, this the new cave is uh, called Shelva. You might see the thing, the red dot in the middle of the map. In the, well, you can see a red dot in both maps, actually, if you have a quick look. But um, the red dot in the map of France, France is like a big pentagon, and uh, that red dot is about where Chauvet is in the, 
in that brown stuff next to it on the left hand side is the massive centra which is the volcanic part and shortways down there in the, where the red, red dot is but in this river meander as you can see what's happened at uh, one time or another is that the river's wound its way down through there but you can see from the dot in the middle that the river probably had different routes going around through there and in fact it did and it had a, a very interesting limestone formation which is called an arc or a bridge, Pont Arc this place is called and just above it as we saw on the other map these three um, smiling French men and women were fiddling around in that scrub at the top there looking for new caves and they found a tiny little cave entrance which was about the size of uh, this banner and um, not being a land of tiger snakes, red belly black snakes, death adders and all those kinds of things, they crawled inside. I always have a good look first because we are a land of all those things, aren't they? Anyway, they crawled inside. Quite a courageous thing to do, you might reckon. And when they did, they found an enormous cave. They went in through a little entrance. You can see on the right hand side there, a little entrance was, which says possible old entrance. It's where they crawled in over the rock fall and all that sort of stuff down inside. And uh, they found all these bits and pieces. And also they found that you could get out if you had ladders and whatever. And uh, later on they did that. Got in through a much easier place up the top. So the reason I've shown you that little map is to, to let you know that the map on the left hand side hasn't got a flat floor. It's all up and down, as you can see from the little sketch map on the right. So um, they explored this thing. When they, when they went inside, they found a, a wonderful limestone cave. Now, you, you're familiar with Janolan and the other sorts of limestone caves we have in Australia. So they found one of these, but look over on the far wall. And um, those red ochre dots are not the typical sort of decoration you find in a limestone cave. Somebody had been there before and put red dots on the wall. Now, we call that graffiti today, but when it was uh, uh, 30,000 years old, like this is supposed to be, we call it art. What are they going to call the stuff painted on the side of the railway carriages in 30,000 years? <laughs> art, perhaps, we don't know. Anyway, this was what this uh, cave looked like inside. And uh, walking around on one of the flat bits, they found these other things painted in black charcoal. And if you know anything about your animals, you'll see there's a big single horned uh, rhinoceros, or so four of them in a row up in the top left hand corner. Another rhinoceros underneath, and uh, more over on that side. And, um, all sorts of horses and bears, and all, you know, these wonderful things painted on the wall. And if you stand at the bottom of those, you can reach them. And, you know, you, they didn't have to build a platform to, to paint them up there at all. And uh, cave bears, cave lions. We find the remains of those animals in the cave in which I'm working, but we don't have, there's no art in our cave because it's a radial crack in an old volcano that we're looking at. And of course they also found other things that are really um, common to most cave art anywhere around the world. And people put their hand up on the wall, they had a big mouth full of chewed up red ochre and they blew it all over the place. You remember when, from when you were feeding your little kids porridge, they could do exactly that stuff when they were about three months old, you know. And um, the heater chimney in our land room still has a few bits of porridge baked hard on it from uh, and one of our boys did exactly that. But uh, this is a slightly more decorative. And the other thing that you can do, of course, is you dip your hand in the crushed up stuff and smack it on the wall. So you get a, a positive or a negative like this. And um, can you see the yellow silhouette of the bear's nose there? You can see that behind it, and there's, there are others uh, not in this photograph, not clear in this photograph. 
And one of the things that's interesting is that, see the four horses in the painting down the bottom, just above the two fighting rhinoceros? This Brzezowski's horse. Brzezowski's horse used to live all over Europe, but now it only lives on the Polish plains. And it's a distinctive little horse because have a look at the mane. It's a little stand-up mane, and uh, these are wild ones. So no one's clipping the darn things. That's how they, their manes look. But look at the picture. And you see the picture down below is obviously Brzezowski's horse. But you can also see that there are uh, things like the uh, the aurochs, the great, the biggest cow-like animal, sit over on the far uh, right with the horns there. There's another one in the top centre. And uh, there's no donkeys. Did someone say <laughs> no donkeys? No donkeys, no, no. Rhinoceros. And, uh, you can see the aurochs is there in a few places. as well. There's a lot of questions about why these things were painted there. And some were painted there, which are animals that you can eat, and some are not. So there are archaeologists who say that they're hunting scenes. But I'm not a fan of the hunting scene. I think that there's something else to do with it. But anyway, we, we might get to that. So here's a couple, here's some more of these enigmatic little things where people got the, their hand with red, stamped it in red and smacked it on the wall. Or a couple there have put their hand on the wall like that. You can see one with the fingers and the thumb there, or two or three with the fingers and the thumb if you look closely. Other bits of it, well, what on earth could this stuff mean? And some people try to um, determine what does it mean. But it's a bit like, you know, you, when, when you're walking, you see those artworks that have got the shit bits of shell and that's really in there, and they're absolutely delightful. Come walking up the corridor, what do they mean? Or are they supposed to be tremendously decorative and attract your eye and tease your imagination? And let you decide what it might be for yourself without worrying what the artist thought it might have been. Because we'll never know that. And more interestingly, perhaps, just like in a lot of the other painted caves, there were the skulls of cave bears and you can see one hanging over a big rock there, which they called the altar. Well, good name. But some of these have been there for a long time. Look at the bottom left, and there's a cave bear skull that's been underneath the drip coming from the roof, and it's been covered with calcite, and the little stalagmite that's grown on top of it as well. And there are other bits of skull and whatever it is around. There's one great cave where the skull's got, down through the two eye sockets, it's got the long bones off the leg. It's a real skull and crossbones picture. But um, I'm not sure that there were pirates about at this, at this time. Now, this cave there was something which was a bit um, twice as tall as me, but it stood on, a back, stood on its back legs. Which is, you know, regardless of the gender, you'd say, sir, to a bear that big, wouldn't you? Yes, sir, what do you say? You know? And um, scary damn things because they hibernated in these caves and when you go into some of them you find a big nest on the ground where they kicked up all the all the soil and laid in there for a bit of a um, hibernate. Happily they became extinct about 24,000 years ago so they're not such a worry these days. I think that's a delightful little silhouette of a bear. If we had a, bits of pieces of paper here and a pencil you know you could Answer yourself when you think you could draw a silhouette of a bear as good as that. Well, in the 1940s, a group of young boats found another cave which is called Lascaux. It's probably the most famous one, and you've all seen pictures of the paintings in Lascaux. But here's a bunch of uh, Amer French archaeologists discussing this thing, these paintings, and see there's another great aurochs at the top there. All the bulls, the mega heroes over this side, a great reindeer with big, um, very Christmassy antlers there, and lots of, and plenty, plenty more bits and pieces. Of it. This was a marvelous cave. These are the four guys who discovered it, and uh, they discovered it by chance, just like the people who discovered Chauvet. They, they were in a forest with a, with a little dog, and they were cutting hazel sticks, you know. Uh, 
got a hazelnuts on they, they make uh, really good poles and sticks cutting hazel sticks for all sorts of things and the dog disappeared down a hole and so they followed the dog and they followed the dog down um, this is not this is a cave door that was put on much later when they followed the dog down they found another cave you can just see in this one that the roof has been painted this is the cave of, this is the hall of the bulls the roof has been painted there and um, they, those little markers were put around because they were Took lots and lots of photographs to make a 3D picture of it. This is a picture you've probably seen before. With a, the horse there and the aurochs behind it. And another couple of horses and various things branching down the bottom. Mega Ceros over on the right hand side in red with its great antlers. That's like that Irish elk. You know, the antlers are 12 feet wide. Uh, 12 feet in the old money. From here to the other side of that table. Imagine carrying that around on your head. Uh, little Santa Claus things that they have now, brown ones, they stick them out the side of cars. You know, so you know, well, imagine these sticking out the side of the car, you know, you take up two lanes. And oh, this wonderful horse, they call this the Japanese horse in Lascaux because it's, it's sort of evocative of Japanese art, isn't it? So this is another wonderful thing. People have interpreted those fluffy things as arrows, uh, if they were arrows, they were fired by someone who was a bad shot. I, I think there's something else altogether, but that doesn't matter. But this is a, another great one. Brzezowski's horse again. Look at the mane sticking up there, little short trimmed mane. Well, I was lucky enough when I was a student to actually visit the original of this cave. So I went into the part that was actually the part that ha actually had been painted in prehistory. And, you know, what's impressive about this is that the artist has tried to give you an idea of the shading of the horse by leaving the belly white, you know, which is white in the real animal anyway, and uh, I think it's a, actually a, a great painting. Now the surprising thing about it is, it's about that big, and it's on the roof. Now think about getting the proportions right above your head, on the, where you can't see the whole thing all at once, etc. That's a pretty good effort by whoever painted that, isn't it? But People who kept visiting this place, and of course, what happened is everybody's breath increased the humidity, and the humidity made algae grow on the roof. And also, there was a lot more carbon dioxide in there because people were breathing out, sighing in, in the pleasure at seeing this thing. And of course, it hadn't been open for more than about 20 years. Maybe the next picture says that somewhere I'll say that. Hadn't been open for more than about 20 or 30 years when it actually had to be closed again because the paintings were deteriorating. They'd been there for 17,000 years, but with so many people visiting, they deteriorated. So it was impossible to let people just wander through and visit it anymore. So they made a replica. They called it Glasgow 2. And here are two big pieces of fiberglass. You can see the roof in one with a the scaffolding there that's been used to make the roof and in the other one you can see where some of the paintings have been done already and they're ready to assemble this thing and turn it into a um, something that you could visit. Anyway, the same thing happened to Lascaux too, the one that the replica that they made. People were visiting, they were loving this thing because they couldn't visit the original. And if you couldn't visit the original, wouldn't you visit the replica? If you wanted to see this stuff, you I'd certainly visit the replica. I was lucky enough, as I said, to visit the original, but I'd certainly visit the replica for a lot of reasons, or a facsimile or whatever. But then, anyway, they've made another one. And this one has got lots more dehumidifiers, air conditioning, etc., etc., and they hope that this one's going to last longer. These are all down in the Dordogne, on the other side of France, to where that red dot was on the picture, if you can remember back to there. But also this one's got a little place in it where they display to uh, people visiting how these things were made. Back to Shore Bay. Shore Bay is the cave that we looked at, uh, the map and all that sort of stuff, where the, those three adventurers had found it. And what they decided to do was make a replica straight away. So it was discovered in about 98 or 90, early 99, and uh, it has never been open to the public. I actually haven't visited the original there, 
but um, I, I probably will next year. But anyway, on the top they made this big fender, which has got a replica that I'll talk about some more, and uh, you know, place a souvenir shop and place of have lunch, and obviously a place of lunch it's France after all, and um, you know, this is on top of where the thing uh, actually is. Now you can see the river meandering in a sort of background there, coming into the hills. You can see it going around the hills and the cliffs that it's making. So they decided to put this thing up on the, the cliffs there. And instead of just having the cave exactly laid out the same way, they decided to make it in a big round building because the, and they changed the shape of the passages. Instead of walking for a long distance through a straight passage, maybe they curved it around to make a corner and all that sort of stuff. But you can see they were going to make a huge building. They're still doing research. And they made all the bits and pieces of the building after they laser scanned it. We use these laser scanning things now really um, lots and lots in archaeology. You stick this machine in the middle of whatever it is that you want to uh, measure, and it, it whips around and shoots little beams out to all the parts all over the place and picks up the uh, distances and angles and bearings and all that kind of thing. You take the disc back to your laboratory, stick it in your computer, press a button, you go, Hoop! and it makes an exact model inside, inside your computer. Well, you can stick it inside another machine, it goes zinc, and it makes a, it'll cut it out of polystyrene and whatever else you want to cut it out of. So they, they cut these things out of polystyrene, molded them out of fiberglass and all the rest of it, and they made, uh, to make the replica. Here they are making some bits of the replica. Look, that's one of those sort of fountain things that the bloke's working on the top. And the bottom side is working on these little tiny thin stalactites and the little pieces that stick out on the side of them called helictites. And they're just, they're just being made on a bit of wood so that they can take them off and put them inside the cave when they build it. And what you don't really see in the photograph is because they're slightly thicker at the tops than they are at the bottom, the colour just changes fractionally as you go down, and they match that really perfectly with their bits and pieces. And they made uh, casts of the cave bear skulls and uh, various other things, and you can see there's a raw cast. There they are painted to make them look as though they're real, and when they laid them out in the replica, that's what the scatter of bones look like and you can see the skull at the back there and it is so real it's wonderful 3d printing they didn't do 3d printing no not there and while they were making all that stuff inside this huge building that they were building they put all the electrics all the air conditioning is in air conditioning ducts going everywhere and the dehumidifiers and all the rest of the things that they need to display this stuff um, really carefully. On the far right, you can see where they just started to install the little walkways. Then they brought pieces into this building to put them all back together. You can see the size of the building because of the, you can see the cherry pickers and whatever it is, putting all these bits and pieces back together. And you go behind the scenes and you can see the things that breaks it all up and whatever. Uh, makes a great job. Here's that. Um, we saw them making the bottom piece of this before. Here they are moving it into position, looking more and more like a limestone cave. More of it, some of it you can see has been already painted with uh, bits and pieces because the laser scanning could pick up where, exactly where all these pictures were. So they took pictures of all those. And then they, when they put it all together, they had artists touching up various um, things so that they were exactly the way that they looked in the original cave. And they also had some students do some of, some of the, some of the rhinoceros, I've got this band on, you know what are these little cattle called um, saddle galloways look like? They're black with a white they look just the opposite of Saddle Galloway. They've got a black um, 
struck on a silver white one. So Obethetsuit was delighted with his task. And when they put it all together, it looks like this. And you can see how they've wound it around so that it's not all in a big long straight line and it's a, a bit more manageable. And the walkways, well, they've got them covered up there because this was taken before it was open to the public, but they've got non slip stuff on them. And not only that, they're wheelchair accessible. And they've got a, a great system for visiting the cave. Everybody who goes in gets a set of ears. You put on these mouse ears and you hear the commentary from the person who's your guide. And so on one side of this cave could be a guide talking about that stuff and on the other side, your guide talking about the other things and you can't hear the other guide, which is a great idea. You only hear what your guide is saying through your mouse ears. And they do it in not bad English as well as in French and a couple of other languages, of course, and uh, which, which is very interesting. But that looks, I mean, when you're inside there, it looks absolutely fantastic. And it looks as real as you'd think you were in a, a limestone cave. And it's, they put all the lights on here so that we could take the photo, but the lights, are, the lights go on and off as you move through the cave, as though you were lighting up the bit that you were just watching. Now, here was where I disagreed with the art critic. This is accessible, as I said, to people in wheelchairs. No chance of going into the original cave in a wheelchair. Absolutely none. Foot, for example, you can't even get it through the hole in the wall and you certainly can't get it around down the stairs or any of the other things that are there. So the only opportunity for people who have to move around in a wheelchair is to visit this replica. Now, why wouldn't you visit the replica that looks as good as this? If you could. I'm not, I don't work for Air France. <laughs> Although if I could, I'd offer you all a ticket because you would be enthralled when you were there. No chance, no doubt at all. The outside, they had a, a huge building to, um, to camouflage, as it were. And architecture in Europe is a pretty imaginative sometimes, but here they were building, this is the outside of the building, inside of doing whatever it is. You, you already know about that. And they built this concrete walls on it and they modelled the concrete and textured it a little bit so that it wasn't just sheets of grey stuff, which is, it can be. And you can see that it's a pretty reasonable size here, the people standing in front of it. When, when you're approaching the thing from down on the, the road that winds up the cliff, that's the first glimpse that you get of the thing as you're coming up the road. So you know that you're in for something that's enormous. And uh, I think that the structure actually matches pretty well. The feeling of a limestone cave, the feeling of the, 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 the uh, cliff that's down below it in which the real cave sits, and uh, the vegetation is obviously exactly the same as the other. Nothing has been changed. It's just that up the top there is this huge structure through which you can wander and uh, see all this marvellous art. Well, I could have shown you lots and lots of pictures of the art itself, but you can find, uh, you know, there are, there's more than enough on the, on the, the internet that you can find about Chauvet Cave. But it's another absolutely fantastic attempt by the uh, the French to let everybody have a share in the the cultural heritage, which actually belongs to all of us when you think about it. You know, uh, our ancestors all came from over there somewhere. <coughs> and and they were all part of the uh, art tradition that was there. So, I have not written back to the New York Times to tell them what I thought about their art critic, but I think there are a lot of very good reasons why we have replicas of some of these things that um, people can enjoy. And uh, it's, it's interesting for me, 
looking at this because from our little uh, centre in France, we have a small museum that shows people things about uh, Neanderthalus and things about modern humans and how they were use, using stone tools and what they were doing. And uh, we have lots of school kids come through there and people come through there various different times. And they love to see what's um, being exhibited, of course, as you would. And the only chance that you've got of seeing it, if you can't see the real thing, is looking in museums and looking at replicas. So there you go. It um, was a quite exciting thing to do. And I thought that um, I just... The French right now need a little bit of encouragement. If you've been watching the news. I, I didn't wear a yellow jacket inside. And I thought you, you, you might take the wrong idea about what I was about. But, um, you know, it's a, they have done a really great job. There's another one in northern Spain that's been done as well at um, Altamira, which is a wonderful painted cave with bulls and things in it. In Spain, what would you expect? And uh, they've, done a, they've made a really good replica as well, apparently, but I've never actually visited it. Although I've visited lots of the painted caves that are in the um, Pyrenees between France and Spain, I haven't visited them on the Spanish side. When I was a student there, it was still, um, Spain was still a bit hard to get into if you had any sort of left wing tendencies at all. So um, I never, I never chanced it. But I did visit a, a lot of the other ones. And I can say that uh, Chauvet, with these um, wonderful paintings, and once again they're enormous. You know, the KB is painted life size inside uh, that area is just uh, very thrilling. So, anyway, I hope you enjoyed our little um, travel log, and uh, I'm prepared to uh, try and answer any questions if you're uh, going. Yes, Warren. Have hey, you got any idea what it costs to build that replica? Oh. Um, yes, I think it was. Uh, the first uh, Lasco one was 59 million, and I believe that this one was three times that much. So, because I, 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 totally I totally agree with you that uh, having a replica, if you're going to destroy the original, what the hell? Okay. Yeah. Turn it off, but I think one affects the other, Alan. Does, does one affect the other? Maybe it does. Yes. Very yeah. good. Yes, I take the point that um, people who are have difficulties in mobility and all the rest of it, certainly need assistance, but uh, I'm glad that they did it, I don't know the sort of assistance that they get over there, but I'm very glad that they did this so that people can visit. Yes. Were you able to determine the volume of the from the cave formation to the time the actual artwork was done in there? Oh, that's an interesting question. The cave the cave formation began in the uh, late Miocene so, and it was painted in the uh, Pleistocene. So between the formation of the cave, there's um, probably five or six million years while it developed, all the different things developed. And we don't know for sure at this moment in time how long before the paintings appeared on the walls that people started to use the cave. That, in the, in the case of our cave, we can work that out because we know a lot more about the sediments. Uh, these days, we can tell when we excavate through the layers of soil in the bottom of the cave, we can tell when there was a floor that people were walking on. You might find that hard to believe, but you think about walking on the sand in a beach, 
when you walk on the sand, you not only do you make footprints, which can disappear easily, but it, the, the sand actually gets sorted out according to the grain size because the big ones can roll down the footprint easier than the small ones that get stuck between the other ones at the top. So we can look at very carefully at the sediment samples and say, oh, here's a flaw because here is a place where the, all the small particles have disappeared. We've only got big particles, etc. There are There are other aspects of it as well. But these days we can sort out a lot more stuff about that than we ever could before. For example, in fireplaces, we can look at the residues that are in there and with DNA analysis we can tell what animal was cooked in the fire because they leave certain amounts of fat and various other bits and pieces or there might be bits of bone in there and uh, all those things can tell us exactly who it was. And uh, in regular fireplaces, how are we going for time? Uh, you're right, yeah, you've got plenty of time. In regular fireplaces, like I look at generally in Australia, Aboriginal fireplaces are just a bunch of rocks usually and uh, charcoal and uh, whatever was put there. But um, if when you look at the rocks, they're often red. And they're red because the iron is burnt. There's a very small amount of iron in the rocks. The iron burns. <coughs> iron is magnetic. When you raise iron above 300 degrees Celsius, it loses its possibility of being magnetic. When it cools down again below 300 degrees, the little iron molecules that are in the rock line up with the direction of magnetic north and magnetic south as it was at the moment when the temperature dropped below 300. Now, magnetic north and magnetic south are not in exactly the same place every year. Because of the movement of all the iron and nickel inside the Earth's core, the north, the magnetic north and magnetic south, they make this big figure eight. So magnetic north right now is in northern Canada. It's not at the North Pole, where you might think it was. And magnetic south is not at the South Pole, which is the rotation pole that the Earth's spinning on. It's not exactly at the South Pole. It's out in the middle of Antarctica somewhere. Well, there you go. This man tells me it's in the sea. And I'm sure it's down there. But anyway, <coughs> we work off the north one. Oh, in the northern hemisphere, we work off the north one. It's easier. And um, so this fire place with the burnt rocks, what we do is we pour a bunch of plaster on top of the rocks and then we put a needle exactly vertical in the plaster and at exactly midday when the shadow is at its exactly north-south by the sun, we mark a line on the, this bit of plaster. Then the plaster goes away to the laboratory and inside the laboratory, they stick the plaster into a, ma a, coil, a magnetic coil, a coil of copper wire, and they spin it in there on the axis that we put in with this needle. Now, this is the opposite of an electric motor. An electric motor has a thing that spins around inside, and it's according to where the electrical pulse is making it, magnets drag the middle part around, and it does it fast. So what we do with this piece of rock is we can then, or this piece of plaster is then, we can then mark on it the line which is the magnetic north because we know the magnetic north and south in the motor that it's spinning around in. So then the difference between the magnetic north inside the molecules in the rock and the magnetic north that's marked on the top of the piece of plaster points to it some sort of distance out there. And we know how fast this magnetic north moves, so by counting backwards, we can tell how old the rock is and when the fire was lit. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> not only that, not only that, but we can look at all the fats and the other things that are in the fireplace, left in the fireplace, and tell exactly what it was that was cooked there. 
That results in the possibility of me writing a recipe book that says, on the 3rd of June, 23,000 BC, somebody cooked a galena in this hole. <laughs> Just in case you wanted to know. Any more questions? Yes. No. I'll try and be shorter. Uh, a lot of paintings look as though they haven't been affected by water. Is, is, water, is water ever going to go through those caves? Yes. Um, the paintings, Margaret's saying that the paintings don't look as though they're affected by water. That's true. So after the, the limestone has been formed under the ocean or wherever it was formed, the, it gets eroded by water and it makes these big caverns. And that decoration that you see in the caverns, all those little things hanging down and all those lovely shapes or whatever, they're built by new water percolating in and evaporating and leaving the calcium salts there on the walls, etc. So that, that's a, the second lot of water that goes in there is um, nowhere near as drastic as the first water. And then, of course, because of the way that all that has worked, the drainage usually is then underneath the current level of that cave. So the same thing is happening down below it, but this, this top caves are no longer affected by water, just the bits that come in it every day. And over, in many cases, all the little holes where water has dripped through in the past have now been filled up by other bits of calcium carbonate. So would that open be affected Come down across those yes, we do find caves where there's been sheets of calcium over the top of the paintings. And that's a very good thing because calcium carbonate has got carbon in it. And we can date carbon by another technique that I won't tell you about now. <laughs> so we can find out exactly how old the paintings are behind the carbon, which is really behind the carbonate, which is really handy. So they, don't, they don't become eroded, they don't become eroded, they just become covered in. Okay, any more questions? No, I think you've, you've exhausted them. I've exhausted them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they think you're better. I think you said at the beginning you worked with the Aboriginals and their money. Where about you doing that? Um, most of Western Australia. In the Kimberleys, lots and lots of time I spent in the Kimberleys, yep. Yep. Is there any comparison between the tools and things you found up in Europe and, in, and the Aborigines? Um, the question is, is there any comparison between the tools used by the Aborigines and those used by prehistoric people in Europe? The answer is pretty much yes, because both of them are just using stone for all sorts of different uh, purposes, but it's a the uh, way the stone was trimmed and shaped and all that sort of thing that makes a difference between arrowheads used in Europe and uh, spearheads used in Australia, so. And it happens at different times, but um, there's no direct correspondence, but there are parallels. Like if you scrape a piece of wood with a stone, we can tell that the last thing that was scraped with that stone was a bit of wood. Or if you scrape a skin with the same bit of stone, we can tell that it was scraped by a skin because they make different uh, edge use wear on these stones. So when you think about what people needed to live here and what they needed to live in Europe, it's pretty much the same stuff. Yes, mate? Sid wants to know whether Neanderthals and so Homo sapiens lived concurrently, and the answer is yes, they did. How, how, how then did the uh, Homo sapiens arrive? His, answer, his question is, how did Homo sapiens arrive? Well, when you think about it, we live here in Australia now as mostly white people from with Caucasian backgrounds. The people who lived here originally were much darker, had much darker pigmented skins. So, you know, the question of how we arrived is we came from somewhere else. 
how did the two different species arrive? Well, now that we actually know that there were several species of humans, not only Neanderthalus and um, Homo sapiens, but in Neanderthalus there were at least two species anyway. One who were in um, Russia and um, Eastern Europe, called the Denisovians, and the Neanderthalus who were in Western Europe. How the two split is a, a bit of a question, but it's like if you think of other primates, like all monkeys, all the monkeys more or less have one origin, but they're all different. Dogs. All dogs have one origin, but you can, you know, there are more dogs than you can poke a stick at. So um, these kinds of, and interestingly, look at the sheep that MacArthur bought here, which will look like goats, and those big merinos that we have now, you know, with this heavy wool on them. So evolutionary developments are ongoing, as Darwin pointed out to us, and uh, sometimes inexplicable. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that interesting, interesting uh, um, talk. And strangely enough, when I was chatting to Peter before, when he told me he was a teacher and where he'd been teaching, he was teaching at a little one teacher school about 15 miles from where my farm was. Uh, I don't recall him, but we would have been there then. We didn't have children at that school, though. Uh, but um, uh, I don't know if there's a, 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 a story in this, but I believe they closed the school after you leave, so is there a message? <laughs> is, is there a message in that one? And, uh, but uh, uh, and the other thing that uh, occurred to me with the way my brain works or doesn't work sometimes, um, that you left teaching not long after that, and I can see that you gained your interest in, in uh, anthropology by uh, all the Neanderthals you found in our district there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> while you were, while you had the twelve months there, so um, I can see that that something like that could have happened. But thank you, Peter, for coming along and and giving us that that lovely talk and uh, just a little um, gift that we give our speakers uh, a little uh, uh, pen that's uh, made by one of our members here, uh, Lord Nelford. He's sitting over there at the moment. He's our treasurer at the moment, uh, uh, and we uh, we just like to give uh, you some little. Uh, Keepsake, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for coming along. Well, thank you very much for that, and thank you for your attention, being a very good audience, and, and uh, good work, boy. Well done. Uh, what a nice little memento. And I'm so glad to be able to report that he never caught me shooting foxes on his property. <laughs>